Station Bremen 1, Station Bremen 2, together with DJB on the 19-meter band. You are about to hear a talk. The last week has been supremely eventful in the history of the world. It has witnessed the climax of the first great German campaign against the major forces of the Allies. And as to the result, there is now no doubt whatsoever. We were confident of victory from the very moment when it was announced that our forces had entered Holland and Belgium for the purpose of frustrating the Allied attack which had been planned against the Ruhr. On the other hand, the capitulation of Holland within five days was something that we should not have ventured to predict. And this week, the King of the Belgians, as Commander-in-Chief of the Belgian forces, made an unconditional surrender on behalf of his troops in order that useless resistance should not lead to further bloodshed and destruction. The politicians who had left him in Belgium in the left loudly protested against his action from the comparative safety of London. But he can well afford to disregard them. He acted in the interests of the people who did not seek safety in flight, and well they know it. The members of the Belgian Parliament who met at Limoges to denounce the King's decision found themselves too few in number to proceed with any so-called legislation against the monarch. It is very interesting to note the contrast in this case between the men who make wars and the men who fight them. The former insisted on beginning armed conflict with Germany and then ran away. The latter stayed to fight, and when they were overwhelmed without any effective assistance from their allies, they took the only reasonable course which could be taken, and the sufferings which they endured, the sacrifices they made in battle, will stand proof against any cheap reproaches from those who conduct wars from luxury hotels placed at their disposal by foreign governments. The surrender of Belgium and the lessons of Holland and Belgium afford final proof, if any further evidence were needed, that small nations would do well to shun like the plague any offers of guarantees or alliances from Britain and France. In the majority of cases, these instigators of armed strife gave no help at all. But in the cases where they did try to render assistance, the results for their protégé were far more lamentable than if they had simply done nothing at all. And it must never be forgotten that neither Holland nor Belgium would have dreamed of taking on the German army, navy, and air force had they not been promised in the most definite terms that the Allies would give them effective and indeed decisive support. The surrender of Belgium was a very natural prelude to the end of the Flanders campaign. The ring of steel about which I have spoken day after day exists no more. Its purpose has been achieved and the Allied forces have been routed so thoroughly that it may be wondered if there is any parallel for such a defeat in the whole of military history. Everywhere within the area enclosed by the ring, resistance has broken down. The commander of the first French army has been captured, and the number of British and French prisoners taken is at present beyond computation. The same is true of the quantities of war material captured. The casualties inflicted on the enemy have not yet been calculated, but it is certain that they were gigantic. In disorder, despair, and chaos, 
The British Expeditionary Force has sought to save itself by withdrawing from the continent. But the very attempt has produced British casualties of a shocking magnitude. On Wednesday, 60 British ships engaged in this operation were hit by bombs and 31 were sunk. And today comes the news of still further British losses. Along a strip of land six miles deep, the British are still trying to cover the retreat of their forces across the channel. But the only question is, how many succeed in getting away alive? Of course, this unprecedented slaughter is not called in England by its true name. Mr. Duff Cooper and his friends are describing this monumental defeat as a heroic withdrawal and a magnificent rearguard action. As you listened to the British radio a week ago, did you get the impression that there was going to be any withdrawal at all? Did you think that the necessity for a rearguard action was being contemplated by the dictator of Britain? I did not. Until defeat turned into rout, absolute, the whole world was being told, hour after hour, by the BBC, that the situation was well in hand, and fresh victories were served up with every transmission. Only a few days ago, the egregious Cooper had the brazen insolence to tell you that the British Army was longing to meet the Germans in combat. Well, surely this wish has been realized. He also said that the British Tommy had shown his superiority to the German soldier wherever the two had met. You must digest this remarkable claim as best you can. How the British Minister of Information can permit himself to utter such asinine claims so obviously contradicted by facts is not intelligible except on the assumption that a public foolish enough to tolerate the dictatorship of Churchill is foolish enough to stand anything. We have long recognized the fact that the British people have been deceived. But is it not a slightly novel experience to see them being treated as congenital imbeciles who are psychologically incapable of disbelieving or even doubting any statement, however ridiculous, made by a minister of the crown. Before the war, National Socialist Germany was often accused of having regimented opinion. The spirit of voluntary sacrifice which characterizes the war effort of the German people has shown this charge to be false. But it is certainly not unfair to say that Churchill and his confederates are acting on the assumption that the opinion of the British people is a lower biological process than the most elementary agitation in the lowest form of protoplasmic organism. How far this assumption may be correct remains to be seen. As the bloody and battered fragments of what was once the British Expeditionary Force drift back in wreckage to the shores of England, it is not impossible that the public will turn savagely upon the men who have so cruelly and unscrupulously deceived it. At any rate, the bitterest disillusionment will now blend with the fear of invasion, which has, not unreasonably, been growing stronger every day. England has received a psychological shock, which not even the strongest nation could bear. And the fault is very largely that of the warmongers who educated the people to believe that it would be an easy matter to deal with Hitler. The decisive campaign of the war has been won by Germany, who now commands the English Channel and the North Sea. The French are demoralized beyond repair. And the neutral world is breathlessly asking what next. It must not be assumed that the character of the war will remain what it is today. A new and powerful factor must now be taken into consideration. There is no longer any reason to suppose that Italy will refrain from active hostilities. Late on Friday night, 
the Relazioni Internazionali, issued a clear-cut manifesto declaring that Italy was about to enter the war on the side of Germany. Her repeated demands for equity had been rejected, and the time had come to achieve by armed force what could not be accomplished by petitioning and pleading. The workers of Italy were now turning their attention to Tunis, Corsica, the Suez, Djibouti, and Nice. There was nothing ambiguous or equivocal in this manifesto. Now, there is some reason to believe that Mr. Churchill had been intending to use the whole of the British Navy for the purpose of resisting a German invasion of England. How will Italian participation in hostilities affect this conception? Will Britain have to look on helplessly while the spine of her empire is broken? Or will she denude her coastline in order to save her imperial communications? Very fortunately, it is Mr. Churchill who will have to resolve this dilemma and not we. We should not care to be faced with such a problem. Moreover, the entry of Italy into the war would mean that France must face another and a most powerful flank attack. I do not wish to say any more on this subject at the present time. But it should be possible to revert to these problems with greater knowledge in the not distant future. On the whole, it is amazing to think of the changes that have come over Europe since that day, not two months ago, when the British Navy set out to land troops in Norway, under the ostensible cover of mine laying in Norwegian territorial waters. The map makers cannot keep pace with the stride of events. It is not a little amusing to think of the trumpetings and flourishings with which Churchill became Prime Minister of Britain. He was the man to frighten Hitler. He was the providential leader who was going to lead Britain to victory. Look at him today. Unclean and miserable figure that he is. And contrast his contemptible appearance with the bright hopes that his propagandists aroused in the mind of people foolish enough to believe that this darling of Jewish finance could really set the might of National Socialist Germany at naught. The old world is tumbling about the ears of the reactionaries who sought to destroy the new. When Germany declared herself independent of their caprice and threw off the shackles of gold, they resolved upon her destruction. But thanks to God and the Fuhrer, it is not Germany that is confronted with destruction today. in a Hamburg, station Bremen 1, station Bremen 2, and DJB. That is the end of our talk. Our next regular transmission of news will take place at 11.15, British summer time, and in quarter of an hour you will hear a special transmission of news in English from the Deutsche.